After thousands of years of human history, appeared the idea that women should share the same responsibilities in the family and society as men. These are moments of struggle for their better position in society. What did it happen, so there emerged a need for the change of the position of a woman in the world? After 6,000 years, has the genetics of the sexes changed? No, but the world has changed and started with the strong pressure on the church to change its understanding of the differences between the responsibilities that women should or should not take on themselves. Numerous scientific studies have found that female hormones even during prenatal development, cause death, apoptosis, of the cells of the brain responsible for male intellectual faculties, while testosterone in men destroy those cells of the brain which are responsible for the female intellectual abilities. The result is variously developed different types of intelligence between the different sexes, so women show more developed V-factor, ability of using words, and M-factor, mechanical memory ability, while men show more developed R-factor, ability to discover a rule or principle, better developed ability to understand relations, finding general principles, correctness and rightness from given data, and N-factor, ability to do numerical calculations rapidly and accurately, etc. In a study titled Empathy, Estradiol and Androgen Levels in Nine-Year-Old Children, the group of authors discovers how girls with a higher level of male hormone testosterone show lower level of empathy compared to girls with excess estradiol, while boys with higher levels of the female hormone estradiol show greater empathy than boys with excess testosterone levels. In order not to be deconcentrated in his responsibilities with those responsibilities which primarily correspond to the female sex, a man's emotionality is, therefore, blocked in the development by the male hormone testosterone. While a woman is more endowed with emotional intelligence that reveals her sphere of responsibility and guardianship for the persons with whom she is directly close, a man is more distinguished by abstract intelligence, issues of general significance that make him the source of the safety of his wife and family, and the source of justice in the human community. Therefore, completely purposeful to their place under the sun, to a woman is more important how she feels, and to a man is more important whether that what he is doing is valuable, powerful, meaningful and just. The capabilities of male and female sex are mutually complementary fulfilling each other. In the same stressful situation, a woman will rather react with emotion of fear and defensively, to preserve children, while combativeness she will leave to a male sex who is for the aggressive defense of family and community enabled by his psychological and physical features. As we see, both scientific research and common sense, indisputably prove that the Bible as well as the 2,000 years of tradition of the Christian Church, on this issue are right. If so, the question arises, how is it possible that such understanding is being promoted, in spite of the scientific facts, that the traditional differences between the sexes and their position in the family and in society are the expression of gender inequality? Cultural and traditional stereotypes about the position of the sexes in the family are also an example of visible inequality. Men were viewed as smarter and more sensible than women who are emotional, so they had the main word in the family. Men have traditionally been viewed as the main worker in the home, so jobs held by men have been historically economically valued and occupations predominated by men continue to be economically valued and earn higher wages. Such blindness before scientific facts is possible only from strong ideological motives, and they are the result of the degradation of the modern man and the distortion of his sexual functions. In contemporary spiritual and moral decadence of man, each gender role is crippled, because the abuse of abilities for the sake of satisfaction, which is the root of gender immaturity, leads to a loss of function due to which this ability exists, so it is revealed also in the function of gender abilities. Emotionality that should be the ability to express love becomes a source of satisfaction, so people prefer the feelings that a loved one is causing to them than her personality. A woman renounces her female responsibilities, child raising and serving to her husband, because it humiliates her arrogance. She becomes arrogant to admit the dependence on a man in those spheres in which it is normal to build a complementary relationship with a man. That is why numerous expressions of tenderness, which were quite common in Western culture at the time of its greatest prosperity, bother her, because she understands them as a humiliation of her own arrogance. Also a man renounces his male enterprising, struggle for social justice and service to society and humanity, and becomes a coward and henpecked. He shifts his own responsibilities to the state, 
which explains why the level of testosterone in men is decreasing from year to year more and more. In such condition, both parents lose the motive of caring for their children because children disturb them in hedonism. In the end, a man loses the meaning of life, because the only true meaning of life, which permeates relations in living and non-living substances, is that he exists for the sake of other and serves the other. The spiritual and moral decadence of Western civilization soon produced that a woman became arrogant in relation to the dependent position on a man, and out of the same arrogance to seek no longer her greatest happiness in the service of a man and family. This decadence of the role of a woman, noted the famous scientist Nikola Tesla, and said about it the following. I had always thought of woman as possessing those delicate qualities of mind and soul that made her in these respects far superior to man. I had put her on a lofty pedestal, figuratively speaking, and ranked her in certain important attributes considerably higher than man. I worshipped at the feet of the creature I had raised to this height, and, like every true worshipper, I felt myself unworthy of the object of my worship. But all this was in the past. Now the soft-voiced gentle woman of my reverent worship has all but vanished. In her place has come the woman who thinks that her chief success in life lies in making herself as much as possible like man in dress, voice and actions, in sports and achievements of every kind. The world has experienced many tragedies, but to my mind the greatest tragedy of all is the present economic condition wherein women strive against men, and in many cases actually succeed in usurping their places in the professions and in industry. This growing tendency of women to overshadow the masculine is a sign of a deteriorating civilization. Practically all the great achievements of man until now have been inspired by his love and devotion to woman. Man has aspired to great things because some woman believed in him, because he wished to command her admiration and respect. For these reasons he has fought for her and risked his life and his all for her time and time again. As we contemplate any change, we naturally take into consideration the results that may follow such an innovation. One of the results to my mind is quite a pathetic one. Woman, herself, is really the victim instead of, as she thinks, the victor. Contentment is absent from her life. She is ambitious, often far beyond her natural equipment, to attain the things she wants. Woman's discontent makes the life of the present day still more overstressed. The high pitch given to existence by people who are restless and dissatisfied because they fail to achieve things wholly out of proportion to the health and talent with which nature has endowed them is a bad thing for the world. It seems to me that women are not particularly happy in this newly found freedom, in this new competition which they are waging so persistently against men in business and the professions and even in sport. The question that naturally arises is, whether the women themselves are the gainers or the losers. Discontent makes for cranks and unnatural people. There seems to be an uncommon number of them about today. This is one of the reasons I remain apart from the crowds. I will finish with this observation about the position of women with the answer to the frequent accusation that biblical gender inequality, in the family and society, was the cause of the restricted rights of female sex throughout history. This can be true when it comes to the history of the apostate Christianity, in which the rights of both sexes, each in their own way, were restricted. But, it is also noted that women were often fleeing from Catholic countries to Protestant, because they knew that freedom from a subordinate position was waiting for them in the Protestant world. In Protestant countries women were at a higher level of respect than they are today, precisely because their female role was highly valued. The woman was regarded as the queen of the house, and the man really related to her in that way. French diplomat and writer Charles de Varigny at the end of the 19th century published a book titled The Women of the United States. About the position of a woman in American society, he wrote. In every place, public or private, at the theaters, in the hotels, in the railroad trains and on board steamers, in the restaurants and in the shops, in the streets and parks, in the drawing room and in her father's house, woman is queen. The origin of such respect for a woman, Charles de Varigny sees in the influence of former Protestantism. 
The women were by no means lacking in boldness nor fearlessness, but it was not until the religious change which England brought about in passing from Catholicism to Protestantism that woman played an important part. She felt the influence of reform as did man. Christianity had given her liberty, but Protestantism freed her from further restraint. It gave her equal rights with man, it recognized even her natural intelligence, even her faculty of insight and of reason, and her duties and responsibilities in this life. She was free to live as she wished, even to marry as she wished. Thus she moved with greater ease in the broader realm of her religious ideas, conforming to them or not, as she wished. She retired within herself, and meditated within her conscience, where none but God might look. A feeling of limitless responsibility arose in place of her former passive obedience, and within her was born a strong and independent soul, she works and plans, and amid constant activity she satisfies one of the most urgent demands of her nature and of her heart, viz, to feel that she is the center of a home, and indispensable to those whom she loves, in the United States, woman is queen, the men builded, labored, planted, the women attended to their domestic duties, prepared the food and mended the clothes, until evening brought the family together around the common meal. A general prayer followed, some Bible reading, a religious exhortation from the Father, and then another prayer. It was a simple and a wholesome life, full of work and religion, with no time for vain regrets and idle dreams, a calm and serious existence, not monotonous or empty, but one in which the mind and body were always active. Their efforts were rewarded by a growing ease, by the comforts won through foresight and labor, by the knowledge of all trades which comes from the necessity of learning. One was at once architect and builder, breeder and farmer, woodman and carpenter, trapper and hunter in short, everything. Each year showed fresh progress, a wider domain, an increased harvest, a greater number of cattle, a growing prosperity in all things. Another Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville, while staying in America from 1831 to 1832, noted a distinction between the American and the patriarchate of many European nations and wrote on this occasion. There are people in Europe who, confounding together the different characteristics of the sexes, would make of man and woman being not only equal, but alike. They would give to both the same functions, impose on both the same duties, and grant to both the same rights. They would mix them in all things, their occupations, their pleasures, their business. It may readily be conceived that, by thus attempting to make one sex equal to the other, both are degraded. And from so preposterous a medley of the works of nature nothing could ever result but weak men and disorderly women. It is not thus that the Americans understand that species of democratic equality which may be established between the sexes. They admit that as nature has appointed such wide differences between the physical and moral constitution of man and woman, her manifest design was to give a distinct employment to their various faculties. And they hold that improvement does not consist in making beings so dissimilar do pretty nearly the same things but in getting each of them to fulfill their respective tasks in the best possible manner. The Americans have applied to the sexes the great principle of political economy which governs the manufactures of our age, by carefully dividing the duties of man from those of woman, in order that the great work of society may be the better carried on. In no country has such constant care been taken as in America to trace two clearly distinct lines of action for the two sexes, and to make them keep pace one with the other, but in two pathways which are always different. American women never manage the outward concerns of the family, or conduct a business, or take a part in political life. Nor are they, on the other hand, ever compelled to perform the rough labor of the fields, or to make any of those laborious exertions which demand the exertion of physical strength. No families are so poor as to form an exception to this rule. If on the one hand an American woman cannot escape from the quiet circle of domestic employments, on the other hand she is never forced to go beyond it. I never observed that the women of America consider conjugal authority as a fortunate usurpation of their rights, nor that they thought themselves degraded by submitting to it. It appeared to me, on the contrary, that they attach a sort of pride to the voluntary surrender of their own will 
and make it their boast to bend themselves to the yoke, not to shake it off. Such at least is the feeling expressed by the most virtuous of their sex. The others are silent. And in the United States it is not the practice for a guilty wife to clamor for the rights of women whilst she is trampling on her holiest duties. It has often been remarked that in Europe a certain degree of contempt lurks even in the flattery which men lavish upon women. Although a European frequently affects to be the slave of woman, it may be seen that he never sincerely thinks her his equal. In the United States, men seldom compliment women, but they daily show how much they esteem them. They constantly display an entire confidence in the understanding of a wife and a profound respect for her freedom. They have decided that her mind is just as fitted as that of a man to discover the plain truth and her heart as firm to embrace it. And they have never sought to place her virtue, any more than his, under the shelter of prejudice, ignorance, and fear. It would seem that in Europe, where man so easily submits to the despotic sway of women, they are nevertheless curtailed of some of the greatest qualities of the human species and considered as seductive but imperfect beings. And, what may well provoke astonishment, women ultimately look upon themselves in the same light and almost consider it as a privilege that they are entitled to show themselves futile, feeble, and timid. The women of America claim no such privileges. It is true that the Americans rarely lavish upon women those eager attentions which are commonly paid them in Europe, but their conduct to women always implies that they suppose them to be virtuous and refined, and such is the respect entertained for the moral freedom of the sex that in the presence of a woman the most guarded language is used, lest her ear should be offended by an expression. In America, a young unmarried woman may, alone and without fear, undertake a long journey. Thus the Americans do not think that man and woman have either the duty or the right to perform the same offices, but they show an equal regard for both, their respective parts. And though their lot is different, they consider both of them as beings of equal value. They do not give to the courage of woman the same form or the same direction as to that of man. But they never doubt her courage, and if they hold that man and his partner ought not always to exercise their intellect and understanding in the same manner, they at least believe the understanding of the one as to be as sound as that of the other, and her intellect to be as clear. Thus then, whilst they have allowed the social inferiority of woman to subsist, they have done all they could to raise her morally and intellectually to the level of man. And in this respect, they appear to me to have excellently understood the true principle of democratic improvement. As for myself, I do not hesitate to avow that, although the women of the United States are confined within the narrow circle of domestic life, and their situation is in some respects one of extreme dependence, I have nowhere seen woman occupying a loftier position. And if I were asked, now that I am drawing to the close of this work, in which I have spoken of so many important things done by the Americans, to what the singular prosperity and growing strength of that people ought mainly to be attributed, I should reply to the superiority of their women.